Hi everyone, welcome back. In our last video, I gave an overview of contrastive PCA. In this video, I'd like to give some more examples of contrastive PCA in action. So let's start with a single cell RNA-seq data set. Now this data set consists of uh, about 30,000 different RNA transcripts that have been measured from many different bone marrow cells. So for every cell, we know how much of that RNA transcript it produced. Um, so this is a very high dimensional data set. And what we're interested in is seeing what this data looks like in two dimensions. Now it turns out that these cells have been collected from a leukemia patient before and after this patient got a transplant. So some of the cells are pre-transplant, some of them are post-transplant. But we go ahead and do PCA, uh, ignoring the labels for now. And what we try to see is if PCA discovers these two uh, populations of cells. If it allows us, if in two dimensions, we see these two different populations occupying different uh, portions of the space, different regions in the space. It turns out that actually the two cells, the two kinds of cells, actually follow a pretty similar distribution in the space spanned by the top two PCs. Okay, so what we go ahead and do then is we go ahead and do contrastive PCA. And when we do that, we find that the cells occupy very different regions in the space. They're quite, they're separated in the top two contrastive PCs. So how did that happen? How did we do this? Well, what we did was we introduced a background data set. And this background data set consisted of RNA expression, again, from bone marrow cells, but this time from a healthy control that had nothing to do with the leukemia patient. So why does this work? Well, what may be going on is that the variation in the bone marrow cells is due to, again, many different factors. It could be due to the fact that bone marrow cells are inherently a diverse group of cells. They consist of many different cell types. And so that variation may be dominating and clouding out the variation that's due to the pre-transplant cells versus the post-transplant cells. Now, when we do contrastive PCA and we introduce, bo introduce bone marrow cells from a healthy control, that actually allows us to um, uh, remove that source of variation and really only see the variation that's due to the pre-transplant versus the post-transplant. So we go ahead and we extend this analysis um, with bone marrow cells that are collected from a second patient, leukemia patient, pre- and post-transplant. So now we have two cell samples that are pre-transplant and two cell samples that are post-transplant from two different patients. The background is still the same. So what happens here? Again, PCA is not very informative. Um, the four populations of cell follow a pretty similar distribution in the space spanned by the top PCs. But when we go down to the contrastive PCs, now we see some differences. The pre-transplant cells from patient one and patient two occupy different regions. The post-transplant cells from the two patients occupy a different region than the pre-transplant cells, but are very similar to one another after transplant. And this may suggest that there's uh, something about these post-transplant cells that make them very similar to, to one another. And this is a hypothesis that can be validated by further testing. Let's move to a different data set. This is um, a data set that consists of SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms, that are collected from individuals from Mexico. And SNPs are basically genetic mutations. So we look at basically about 500,000 genetic mutations from uh, individuals in Mexico. And the reason we do this is that genetic uh, mutations and SNPs in particular, allow us to understand the ancestry of a group of people. It turns out that where you're from um, really has a big effect on what kind of genetic mutations you carry. And actually doing a PCA on this matrix here, the matrix that consists of individuals by SNPs. So, you know, let's see, you have N, N individuals, and in this case, about 500,000 SNPs. If you end up doing PCA on this matrix, the, uh, the individuals, when plotted on the first two dimensions, typically tend to cluster in uh, geographically or historically significant ways. So this is uh, something that you can actually see, especially clearly with individuals from, let's say, Europe, you do PCA on European individuals and you find clusters that correspond to individuals from France next to individuals from Spain and so on because geographical and historical context plays a significant real, uh, role in what genetic mutations are carried. But it turns out that this doesn't work for, uh, for individuals from Mexico. Uh, 
and for a very specific reason. And that is most Mexican individuals have a component in their ancestry that is European and another, con and another component that is Native American. And this axis of European versus Native American uh, component in, in a Mexican individual's ancestry is so, uh, so dominant that, that, that the differences between Native Americans and Europeans is so much more than the differences that are intra-Mexico that this dominates any sort of PCA type analysis that you do. And so what you end up finding is that the top PCs correspond more to how much Native American versus how much European ancestry uh, you have, as opposed to uh, within Mexico, what part of Mexico you're from. And that complicates localization based on um, SNPs for individuals who are in Mexico. So what we decided to do is we decided to introduce a background data set. And ideally, we would like to have found a background data set that consisted of Native Americans, let's say, uh, and, and, and some from uh, individuals from Europe. And so what that would do is that would have this European versus Native American axis present in the background. And that would allow us to search for a projection of the target data set that doesn't have this component of uh, this variation. Now, we didn't actually have such a data set. But what we did have was we had a data set that consisted of individuals from Mexico and from Europe. And again, this now what this does is that this kind of the, the major variation in this data set is in the European versus Native American direction. So as long as we're able to remove that, uh, as long as we're able to remove that source of variation, we'll find variation. The hope is to find variation that is um, intra-Mexico. And that is actually what we end up finding. So what these plots show here is each dot is an individual and that is color coded by what state of Mexico they're from. Because these are five different states. If we just do a regular PCA plot, what happens is that the distribution of these points doesn't seem to um, depend at all or correlate very well with the uh, state of Mexico that they're from. But if we then do CPCA, again, what we're doing here is we have a target data set that consists of individuals from Mexico. We remove the Native American European axis of variation by having a suitable background data set. And what ends up happening is now the distribution of points does tend to cluster based on what state of Mexico they're from. And the really interesting thing is that if we compare this to a map of Mexico, we find that the geographic distribution of the states of Mexico matches the distribution of individuals in the top uh, contrastive principal components. So in particular, you have the Sonorans over here um, in one extreme versus the Mayans on the other extreme and, and, and the other states in the middle, which is similar to the distribution of states uh, geographically. Let's turn to a third example. This data set is a synthetic data set. Uh, it is constructed by putting the handwritten digits 0 and 1 taken from the MNIST data set on top of grassy backgrounds that are taken from the ImageNet data set. So we superimposed handwritten digits, specifically zeros and ones, on top of images of grass. Okay, if we take these images of grass and then we do PCA on them, and then we color code each point based on what digit appears in the image, what we find is we don't find any sort of clear clustering in the images based on the digit. And this is not surprising if, because the backgrounds are much more complex and much more varied and a much bigger source of variation than the handwritten digits. And so what, what's likely happening is that the images of grass are uh, responsible for the uh, top two PCs rather than the handwritten digits. So what do we do here? Well, we can introduce a background data set that consists of images of grass, only grass. And it turns out it doesn't even have to be the same images of grass that were used to construct the target data set. It can actually just be other images of grass as long as it has a similar covariance structure. And I'll talk about that in the next video. But if we do CPCA using the target data set as the target and the background data set, just images of grass as the background, what ends up happening is now the points do end up clustering based on the presence of the digit that is in the image. And this is uh, really nice because it allows us using, without knowledge of the labels, um, it allows us to actually discover that there are two different populations with some degree of separation between them. Now, the nice thing about this data set is because it's 
um, uh, uh, synthetic, we can actually get a, uh, and because it's image-based, we can actually get an understanding of what's happening by looking at the principal components and the contrastive principal components. So what I show here is just the principal component one, the first principal component, and the first contrastive principal component. And I have color coded the uh, each pixel in the original images. So these are 784 by 784, uh, rather 28 by 28 uh, images. And what we can see here is we can actually weight every single pixel um, uh, in the first principal component by the weight that PCA assigns to them. And so what basically means is this is how important every principal, how, how every, uh, this is how important every pixel is in the first principal component. So light colors, white colors represent plus one. So high absolute weight. Black pixels represent negative one. Again, high absolute weight. And gray pixels represent something in between. So low absolute weight. And so what we find is that a uh, high absolute weight is assigned to these pixels here in the bottom as well as some of the pixels in the middle. And so the high absolute weight is assigned to the uh, pixels in the bottom, suggesting that a lot of the variation can be ascribed to those pixels. And so it, because PCA is putting a lot of weight to those pixels, it's not too surprising that the first PCA is not useful for discriminating between zeros and ones, because no information about zeros and ones, the handwritten digits, it, is present in these pixels. On the other hand, if we take a look at contrastive principle component one, we find that almost no weight is given to the background at all. In fact, all of the weight is either assigned to that region in the image, which is responsible for making this image a zero, or that image, uh, or that region in the image, which is responsible for making this image a one. And so then it's not too big of a surprise that CPCA1 is actually useful for discriminating between ones and zeros. So we'll end here. In the next video, we'll talk about how CPCA actually works, what the algorithm is, as well as some theoretical properties of CPCA.